Hi everyone, you've got Brittany Nelson from Indiegogo here. Thanks for joining us in Aero Electronics for today's AMA webinar about how to choose a contract manufacturer. Before we begin, a couple of technical notes. First, this is a live Q&A, so to ask a question, just click the ask a question button at the bottom of your screen. You can also see other people's questions that have already been asked and you can upvote them um, as what you want us to address first. Uh, I can see that some of you have already asked some really great questions, so please keep them coming. In addition, if you have any technical challenges, please let us know in the chat bar to the right. We're also recording this AMA, and we're going to share the recording with all of you afterwards. I also want to tell you a little bit about the Aero certification program really quick. Um, Aero and Indiegogo's initiative to help tech entrepreneurs navigate manufacturing challenges, along with prototyping, supply chain management, and other important things before and after your crowdfunding campaign. We've also teamed up with at and Business to provide extra support and SIM cards to IoT developers. This program is 100% free and offers benefits like one-on-one -on -one engineering consultations and exclusive discounts and rebates as well. You can learn more and join the program by clicking the green button near the bottom of your screen. With that, let's introduce our two experts today from Aero, Keaton Anderson and Taylor Johnson. I'll let each of them introduce themselves briefly and then we'll dive into the questions. Keaton, take it away. Hi everyone, my name is Keaton Anderson. I am an engineering manager at Aero Electronics. Um, I've done a couple of these kind of things in the past and so I'm gonna be here tag, tag teaming with Taylor today just to answer a few of your questions. Um, Taylor, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Keaton. My name is Taylor Johnson. Um, I've been with Aero for four years. Um, the past nine months, I've been with our rapid prototyping and on-demand manufacturing group, working on getting prototyping and small run production built um, for entrepreneurs and other people like yourselves. Um, and before that, I was an industrial engineer at our Phoenix production facility. Um, and I'm currently located in uh, Temple, Texas. So Brittany, back to you. Awesome, thanks guys. All right, I will dive into the questions. Our first question is, how do we prevent copycats from China taking our innovations even if we have patents? So how can we rely on companies and hand out our ideas to a Chinese company who's gonna help us realize the ideas and make them come to life, but then at the same time, make sure the idea is not going to be stolen? Keaton, I'll let you take this one. Yeah, sure. So um, I'll, I'll take it a little bit from a component side to talk a, a, about some of the things that you can do going into a CM. Um, so one of the things that is becoming increasingly more popular is a line of parts called crypto authentication ICs. And what they do is they enable your product so that when you go in and you've produced it through a CM, um, if someone tries to go in and tamper your pro with your product or tries to look at your code or something like that, it'll actually just wipe the chip completely clean. Um, and so when you hand these parts to the CM, if someone's trying to go in and dig in there, it'll actually just completely erase anything that's on the advice. Um, and really what we're seeing is that in many circumstances that your software is starting to become more of the differentiating factor, that hardware is becoming a little bit more uh, mo modernized and kind of commoditized with things like Arduino and Raspberry Pi. People have a lot of hardware availability um, that the software is really some of the uh, kind of key factor there. Um, and the other thing that they do well is so let's say you have like a cordless drill or something like that. The crypto authentication chips actually will verify that the battery pack that you're inserting is correct and from the manufacturer and, and that it's authenticated that's your product. And so it actually adds another layer of security to make sure that your customer is not going to use another third party who has copied your device or something like that is going to end up being able to kind of knock it off. It'll make sure that there's some sort of preventative measures in place so that we can ensure that the product is actually authentic and that we know where we're getting from. So that's kind of from uh, a component side. Taylor, do you have anything else you want to add on that? Yeah, um, just for more of just a general side, um, just having a standing relationship with a CM is definitely helpful. Um, and make sure that you have NDAs in place to make to, to help protect that. Um, I know that that still, you know, brings up some of a concern, but I think that's where kind of what Keaton had mentioned um, can maybe help mitigate that if it's if it's truly uh, something that you're you're very worried about. Thanks, guys. All right, next question. I'm getting varying molding costs for plastic injected parts that are relatively tiny, like one x to six x. 
What questions do I ask? How do I make the factory take some responsibility for maintaining the quality? And how do I discuss payment terms with them? Yeah, so something to consider when you're looking at pricing, um, I'm assuming that the, maybe this varying pricing is coming from separate CMs. Um, and if it's coming from the same CM, I would suggest maybe make sure you're working with the same contact. Um, so that way um, you're not, you know, crossing lines um, and you're not getting a quote from three different people. Um, but if you're comparing from separate CMs, make sure you're comparing apples to apples. Um, so one big thing to look at is location. Um, so if you're comparing something built in Mexico versus China, you're obviously going to have have some some cost differentials there. Um, another big one is the quantity you're requesting and the uh, the turn times that you're asking for. Um, if those are maybe outside that CM's wheelhouse, it might they might charge you more, right? Um, if it's something that is, you know, they normally do a thousand piece runs and you're asking for 10,000, um, you're gonna shut down their lines for a long time, so they might charge you more for that. Um, something else to look at is the tooling types you're looking at, making sure you're comparing the same tooling um, across those CMs, as well as just their overall capabilities and and making sure that it's kind of, it's a sweet spot for, for what you're looking for. If it's something that's outside your realm, uh, outside the realm of what they like doing, that might be why you're seeing some increased pricing. Um, as far as taking responsibility for maintaining quality, um, when you're working with the CM, it's best to ask for your, uh, or start working with them, um, their equipment list and how old that equipment is. This could also drive some of your pricing. If they just brought brand new equipment, that could be why you're seeing higher pricing. They have to pay that off versus if they have older equipment that's paid off and they're just maintaining. Um, also their certifications, um, making sure that they're accredited through the proper proper channels for whatever type of device you have. Um, if it's a consumer or aerospace, things like that. And also their uh, QMS, which is their quality management systems. Um, and this is what they have to do in order to maintain those accreditations and it's what they're audited against. So this can show you things like their on-time delivery, first pass yield, um, things like that give you a good idea of what you can expect. Um, and as far as payment terms, Keen, did you have any notes on that? Yeah. Um, so in terms of kind of the payment situation, it really depends on um, when we're looking at kind of some of the variations in terms of how they're expecting you to be able to deliver. So some of your smaller shops are going to expect it to be all up front so that they know they can be able to recoup their costs. Um, whether people may be able to pay a little bit more on terms. And so I think when you're seeing some of the variation in pricing there and payment terms, um, some of that comes down to both size and then location as well in terms of whether or not you'll have a line of credit established or something like that. Absolutely. And just make sure you get everything in writing for that um, yep. and that you both both you and the CM agree on those terms. That's very good advice. Always get it in writing. <laughs> All right. Our next question is, how many contacts do you keep at a CM? How soon is too soon and how late is too late to visit? Yeah, so you should have a, have a team at a CM, but you should have one person that's your main point of contact, and that should be your program manager. Um, this is the person that you should go through everything with. Um, they should be the person if you have questions, concerns, if you want updates, anything like that should be this person. Um, and then they should additionally have some sort of technical support, like an engineer, as well as you know any quality or test engineers or technicians that are able to give updates um, on things like that. Um, but everything should go through that program manager. Um, and if they're going to be out of office or anything like that, they should have someone that, that is a backup for you to go through. But you definitely don't want to be talking to three separate people because um, then information can get lost and, and drop through. You want one person managing everything. And obviously, you can talk to those technical supports and stuff, but that program manager should always be involved. Um, and visit as soon as you can. Um, as soon as you've selected a CM or a few CMs that you want to visit, um, go do it and get, in, get them involved in your, in your project um, as soon as you can. Obviously, make sure that you have design files and bombs and things like that. And it's not just still a concept, um, but as soon as you're you're ready to go into production, um, start visiting those, because um, they can actually help you um, with some DFM, which is designed for manufacturing. So make sure you're designing your pro your process um, to, to fit into theirs as, as easily as possible. Um, that way you have the, you know, the best quality and the best turn times that you can get because you've, you've really designed that process to fit right into theirs. Um, so yeah, if you're already in production, it's definitely too late to visit. You need to visit as, as soon as you can. Awesome. Okay. The next one is, what are the best countries outside of China to find a CM? Yeah. So from my experience, um, I've seen a growing market inside of Mexico that has a lot of production facilities. Um, specifically, we went to visit in Guadalajara, and that's a very industrial um, area within that country. And, and they're really focused on kind of spinning up within 
high tech, quick designs, being able to move to production and doing it um, in, in both a rapid rate and at a pretty reasonable cost. So um, that's one area that we've seen. And, and actually, we've seen a couple of places where um, the connections between the people within the Guadalajara or the Mexican um, based facility work back into the United States. So you may be able to have a local contact, um, particularly if you're working within the US. If you're outside, you may you may need to be able to kind of continue to work with someone over phone or something like that. Um, but you may be able to have someone who can work both on that side and then um, as well as with the counterparts in Guadalajara. Um, and then I think, uh, you know, Taylor, is there any more countries that you've kind of seen come up? Yeah. Um, so currently um, some, some other ones that we've been exploring is Malaysia, Vietnam, um, obviously Mexico, like you just mentioned, and there is a potential for India as well. Um, I think it really kind of depends on what fits your overall supply chain. Um, where yeah. you're going to be selling this product and where all those components are coming from, that makes the most sense if you still want to stay in, in Asia in some way, or or if Mexico and staying in North America is a good fit. Yeah, and I've seen we've seen a rise in um, so there, there's a lot of companies who will do kind of an online manufacturing service where you can be able to upload parts and and your mm -hmm. like that and get kind of more of an instant quote. Um, so the U.S. actually does tend to be somewhat competitive in that range as well. So if you haven't shopped it. I would recommend kind of taking a few different countries, looking at some different online quoting tools to see if you can get different prices and help. Maybe that will help you make your decision in terms of do I want to go with someone a little bit more local to have a little bit of a closer contact, or am I okay with going somewhere else if I can get it maybe a little bit cheaper? Absolutely. And there's some CMs that have footprints here in North America to do your MPI, your new product integration, that can then um, translate over to their mirror facilities overseas to get that, that cheaper uh, production rate. So that's obviously if you're doing doing a lot of um, MPI, I highly suggest looking at someone that can do um, that here in the U.S. Um, to reduce that travel or or wherever you are located to reduce that travel of having to go overseas just to just to do some MPI stuff. And you, you said NPI. Can you define that for us? Yeah. New product integration. So it's a lot of um, if you're not fully designed and if you need the you need some help on that. Um, some CMs offer that. It's additional uh, fees. Um, but getting that product um, up and running here in the U.S. and then you can transfer it over. Yep. Awesome. All right. How are patents handled with the CM? I assume my design should be patented, but what about the CM process? Yeah, so first, um, definitely not a patent lawyer or patent expert by any means, so please make sure you're obviously consulting someone that is. Um, but yes, you're, on a high level, your um, design should be patented, your product should be patented but that CM process belongs to them. Um, and a lot of times the CMs consider their process intellectual property as well. Um, and so it's up to their discretion to how much they, they wanna share with you as well, because it's it, that's their, their product, for lack of a better word. Um, so obviously you can discuss high level with them what their process is, um, but that's theirs and, and belongs to them and you have no need to need to patent it. Um, if there is something specific to your assembly that you are worried about, um, as far as you know that process, I would suggest talking to to a patent lawyer or someone who can who can help you with that. But anything you give over to them should be covered in the NDA that you sign. Okay. Next question is a little bit more specific. What are the things to vet when looking for a medical device manufacturer? If going after a Department of Defense contract, your device cannot be manufactured in China. Costs are higher in the U.S what resources are available to start my search? Yeah, so I'll, I'll um, take a step from kind of the, what are some things that you should be paying attention to from a CM perspective? Um, and, and one thing to keep in mind, especially within the medical kind of realm of devices is that there's very strict um, kind of requirements in terms of what documents you need to provide, especially when it comes to kind of medical classifications and when you're going to do it through uh, if you need to run through the FDA or whatever you're going to be able to need to, if it's class one, class two, class three, so on and so forth. Um, and the documentation process of those is really critical in terms of being able to actually get your device moved to those appropriate classes. So one thing that I would do when looking to vet a CM associated with a medical device is to make sure and kind of ask them, hey, what's your documentation process look like as you're going through? How do you do you document how you do the manufacturing? Do you show me when I'm, my board's running? What does that look like? Um, and I think that that's pretty important because you don't want to get down the line uh, with a CM where you kind of say, hey, I've run a couple devices and now I'm going to be ready to go and they don't have any of the documentation available. Um, and, and I think the other thing that you'll note is that CMs will typically, if they have a specialty, they'll probably let you know and say, hey, this is something that we've done before and, and here's the process about how we go about it. Um, it's very similar in many ways to what we see from 
um, say like a design services company or, or firm, they will kind of let you know, this is the area that we tend to specialize in. Um, so I, I would just make sure that when you're kind of doing your initial research, see if they've mentioned how they go about doing the process, what makes them specific, what criteria they have, what certifications. Um, those are the kind of things that I would first touch on. Uh, Taylor, do you have anything else you want to add? Um, the only other thing was just, you know, some general, you know, for medical, you need to make sure that their ISO uh, 13, what, 13485. Um, yeah. So obviously yeah. making sure they're that, but like Keaton said, I mean, they should, that should be yeah. something that they are, give to you and, and that process you go through. But that's yeah, it. And they, and it might be listed on their website about that certification. So that could be a yeah. good thing to start looking to see um, who's the first person that I might want to contact. Yeah, for. that should be your your first kind of way to weed through, weed through yeah. those CMs. If, if they're not... If they're not that ISO, then it's not really worth talking to them. <laughs> and for someone that's just starting off in this process, like what do you do? You do a Google search for contract manufacturing. Like where where do you start? Yeah, so I mean, you you always can go to Google and go through. I mean, one thing that's challenging about Google is anyone can pay for ads and kind of get it on there. So um, you know, I I would definitely say that that's a, not a bad place to start, but. Again, that's one of the reasons why we've established the Aero Certification Program to be able to answer things like that and say, hey, we have a few partners that we know that work in that realm. So um, I'll do a shameless plug of the program. It would definitely be something that we'd be happy to help you guys if you're looking for a specific partner or if you have certain requirements. That's something that Aero does really well, and we'd love to be able to talk to you about what you're working on. We've had a couple of people ask for your guys' contact details, and I would say definitely fill out the quick form to join the Aero Certification Program, and the next step in that process will be a one-on-one -on -one consultation with an Aero engineer, and they can help you out for sure. Yeah. All right, next question. This Oh, there are a lot of questions within this one question. Okay, we'll take it one step at a time. <laughs> Please talk about how to, number one, compare different CMs, Number two, how to verify that they can deliver on what they promise. Number three, how to compare various countries of manufacturing in terms of pricing, IP security, and ability to deliver on promises. Yeah, so I'll, I'll start this one off. So um, we've talked a little bit about comparing CMs and kind of hit on some of the different aspects of this, but just from kind of an overarching perspective, one thing that I would really try to define with a contract manufacturer is what is the expected deliverable um, when I'm looking at comparing them. So in certain circumstances, you'll have countries where um, they're willing to help you assist with the design, they're willing to be able to help do some of the design work for it, but they're gonna own the rights to that design when they get done. So they may be able to say, hey, we'll send you the units, but you're gonna have to pay me a certain cost every single time you want one of these produced, and I'm gonna own those files to make sure that I'm gonna keep kind of the design in-house so that when you wanna buy it, I have to, you have to come to me kind of thing. Um, so when I'm comparing it, the first, some of the first questions I'm gonna be asking is, do I own the IP or do you own the IP? Um, what is it going to look like from a timetable to be able to return? How much is it going to cost per unit? How do you do the units? In some circumstances, you'll see it where um, people will maybe subsidize some of the cost into the production to help you out with the design services or they want to sell components. So I think I would just try to understand from a complete scope of what is this going to look like when I actually go through? Is it just a product contract or is it a longer term agreement for that? And then what's kind of some of the expected deliverables? So. Um, those would be kind of some of the first things I would do. Um, so the rest of the question in terms of uh, kind of various countries and IP security, I think we kind of talked a little bit about just making sure that your, your files are secure, having that patent in place, having protection on the device to make sure. Um, it is challenging, depending on the country, to be able to say that you can know exactly every single patent law that everyone has, um, and it's different for everybody. So the best that you can do is to make sure that you're protected by having your your um, device patented in the country that you're in and wherever you're going to be incorporated, um, if that's the route you choose to go. And then making sure you again have certain device protections built in place, like you know making sure that your software is something that uh, you're maybe not distributing or you're going to put on yourself, or uh, having a way to be able to say if this is cracked open, I know that it's going to be protected. Yeah, definitely. And I think the only other thing when, when you're kind of going and, and comparing those CMs um, and you're looking at, sorry, specifically more about which countries like we just mentioned is, or like yeah. we've already mentioned is the supply chain, right? Where are you selling and where where are you located as well as where is the, the supply of most your components located? You know, if, if you're not located in the US, it doesn't make sense to necessarily come over here Right, um, things like that. Yeah. All right, we've got a question in the comments from Rakim. I have a, I've created a C, a 
CAD model, yeah. uh, CAD model for product, but it has not been reviewed by an engineer. Does your CAD model need to be fully specced before going to the manufacturer, or is it good to just use the engineers from the manufacturer since they know how their tools will work? Um, so for this one, if you are using the CM and they're helping you with the design and that MPI that I mentioned earlier, that new product um, integration, um, then you can use them to, to maybe spec through some of this, but normally they're going to build to whatever is on that file. Um, potentially if they, if they catch something, they might bring it up, but a lot of times they're not going to review for, does this work as you intended it? Cause they don't know how you intended it necessarily. Um, so I recommend, you know, partnering with, with an engineer or, or getting a design engineer to, to look over it. That's someone you can, you can go through that with um, before going to the CM or if the CM has services like that that are an additional fee. But if you're just sending a design file to a CM, they're just gonna build to that design file. And if it doesn't work, that they built it to the design file most of the time. Key yeah, to I, was, I was gonna add to that comment and just say that um, for, for a contract manufacturer, one of the things to keep in mind is when you hand them your CAD files, a lot of designs look very similar, right? So a connected soccer ball, which has an accelerometer to see how hard did I kick it, might look very similar to a crane that has a accelerometer on it to make sure it's not tilting one direction or the other too much. So when they go to build it, they don't necessarily know what the intention of that product is. And they're just going to say, okay, this is what you've handed me. I'm going to build that now. Um, so I would really make sure that at, when you're going to a CM, you are as close as possible to a finalized design. And you're going to do, obviously, maybe some smaller production runs where you're putting in a couple of units before you're going to the mass manufacturing stage and you'll be able to test and whatnot. Um, but understand that from an engineering perspective, those designs actually may look very close. And so you want to make sure that you've kind of tested through and worked through kind of a finalized uh, version of your schematics, bombs, Gerber's, stuff like that before you hand them over. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Okay, what are the benefits of using a CM versus going straight to the source? Um, so for this one, um, so the CM typically is the direct source. Um, so I'll answer these questions kind of in two ways. Um, so one, if it's, you know, going to a CM versus, you know, doing it yourself, um, unless you're planning on purchasing very, very expensive equipment, um, you need to use a CM. So where that kind of differs is you can use an OEM like an arrow. Um, that can that can do that for you. Um, it can help you through that process. So some of the benefits of using an OEM, and since I've worked for Arrow, that's really my only example I have. So again, another shameless plug. Um, but we work with multiple CMs um, in varying locations around the world. So we do production through these CMs. We have the volume through there. So you can utilize that existing relationship to potentially get uh, better pricing, better turn times, as well as knowing that we've gone through and vetted them. We've gone through that audit process. We audit them regularly and we have that long standing relationship with them. So it can also mitigate some of the other terms, like some of the IP security terms, uh, concerns we've talked about. Um, and as well as potentially even your need to go visit the CM yourself. Um, that's a benefit with working with an OEM versus directly with the CM um, or, you know, doing, doing the production yourself. But I definitely don't recommend that. Yeah. Yeah, and I think what I would add to that is, um, you know, Taylor mentioned, like, you, most of the time the equipment for this is going to be, like, super expensive. So you're probably not going to want to delve into it. Not to mention that, like, um, contract manufacturing facilities have very strict regulations in terms of, like, static electricity and how their production process goes and, and where pieces are laid and stuff like that. So um, it's typically something that, like, if you do it for a living and, and you, you want to try to in, engage with someone who kind of has done that multiple times, has seen some of the, the key failures, um, and then the only other piece that I would recommend is that understanding your supply chain, as Taylor's kind of already mentioned, and understanding where your components are coming from. If you have a, a line out or a stock shortage or something like that, it can potentially slow up your run. So when you're talking about working with a CM or, or going directly to the source, having a secondary source of your own components, if you're needing to supply them yourselves, is going to be really beneficial to make sure that you don't have a kind of a backlog where you're going to run out of time and you're going to say, how am I going to be able to get these to be able to keep my, my line moving? So um, just kind of when you're thinking about that from a directly to the source, if the CM is not doing the direct purchasing and you are supplying the components yourself, it might be good to already have stock on them in case you need to supply more. Good advice. All right. Uh, when I visit a CM in person, what should I be looking for? Um, so when you visit a CM in person, um, I've already kind of gone over the three things you should ask before you even visit. So I'll just kind of revisit those. That's that QMS, that quality management system, um, their equipment list and how old all that equipment is and their certification. So you should already have all of that. 
So when you're actually physically there, some things to look for is things like, are the lines standardized? Um, can I move my, can my product move from line one to line four, no problem? Or am I gonna be stuck on line one? So if line one's backed up, my product's backed up. Um, what's their capacity like? Are they at 50% capacity or are they at 99% capacity, right? Is there gonna be room for your product to move through smoothly or is it always gonna kind of be backed up a few weeks before it even starts? And those are questions you can ask too while you're there um, because if you're there on one given day, who knows what tomorrow looks like, um, but ask what their average capacity looks like. Um, do they do full turnkey or consigned or both? So do they want to source all of the material themselves, kind of like you mentioned in the previous uh, question? Um, or do they, you know, do they want you to source it all and consign it? Or is it a mix of both? They'll do full turnkey and they'll, they'll do everything, but maybe there's a few custom parts that you're sourcing yourself that you're going to send over to them. Um, kind of what, what do they want to do there and how would it affect your cost? Um, look for general organization and cleanliness. Um, if there's a layer of dirt on everything, that's probably not a great sign. Um, and if there's no way to tell what someone's working on, Right? If there's no information on that job, they're not looking at specs, they're not, you know, if it's just kind of chaos of kind of everyone running around and there's piles of parts sitting places, that's not really a good sign. You want things to be clean, um, everything has a place, You want, and you want to be able to visually see how it's moving through the process with signs and things like that. And as well, you want to ask about their shop floor tracking system. So how do they look at where things are in the process? Um, because it's that, that way you know from way, when you go, hey, I want an update, where is this? What can you expect from that, right? If if it's kind of all in the supervisor's head or they have to go track down that supervisor to go, hey, when is this going to be done? Or is it a TV screen with everything ticking down, showing when it started, when it's moving to the next step, when it's estimated to, to be shipped by, things like that. Um, so those are some of the things that I would recommend looking for. And Keaton, I don't know if you had, had any further recommendations. Yeah, I, I think exactly on the lines of what you're looking at there. Um, I think the cleanliness one is definitely one that I'll, I'll touch on again. Every CM that I've been to that's that's good, you pretty much could eat off their floors. Like they, it is immaculate, it is very clean in there. Uh, and it's actually like really funny because a couple times when I've gone, you know, you, you get dressed in the full gown and everything like that. And then there's very strict like tape lines and you cannot leave lines because you, you don't want to get anywhere and contaminate anything. So um, just, just to like reiterate that if you go somewhere and it's, it seems disorganized and boards are laying everywhere and there's a bunch of things and there's like components on the floor. That's not a great sign. <laughs> yeah. Trust your gut on that. Yeah. I, I think the colonies is a good gut check. Yeah. Um, and, and the facility I worked in for three years, we had the ESD smocks and the lines that you couldn't go in and, and touch things um, and make sure that's enforced um, just because there's lines on the floor, make sure you don't yeah. see people just roaming around anyway um, and things like that. But yeah, I mean, it should be a good, it should be an instant kind of okay yeah this they keep up with this place and they keep it clean and they definitely care about it versus oh they're just kind of getting in getting done every day and not taking the necessary time to to make sure that's upkept. Yep. You talked about capacity like what how, I guess how many projects is a CM typically working on at one time like how much special attention should you expect like what what are, what's the scale of this? Um, and that's gonna that's gonna vary greatly depending on on the CM. Um, a CM could have four lines, or they could have twenty, right? Kind of depending on how much they do. But that's definitely questions you should be asking to see where you're gonna fit into that, and also asking what their average order order quantity is that goes through. Um, if they say their average order quantity is ten thousand, and you're looking for thousand piece runs, it is probably not the best fit. Um, so asking and finding those fits because there should be a CM that fits kind of every little niche of that. Um, and as far as capacity, um, more in a general term of just, if they do have 20 lines, are only 10 of them ever being used? So that way there's, you know, there's there's extra room for those 10 lines. So if you do come in with large order quantities, you know, you're gonna be met. Or are there four lines that are always used, always full, constantly? Um, and so that's where you can know how much you're gonna have to wait before your product even starts production once you place an order. Yep. Yeah, and I think I would think of lines um, in terms of like lanes on a highway. So if you go in there and they don't, if they don't have a lot of capacity right now, it's pretty easy to get things through. Then, you know, it's pretty easy to shift one way or the other and then it'll keep kind of the flow going. Um, obviously, the more lanes on the highway you have, the more cars you can be able to take and produce at one, you know, they'll go through at one time. So I think when I'm thinking of capacity, that's one thing that I would look at is just there's different tiers for contract manufacturers. The, again, the, the equipment is very expensive. It's hard to update and maintain. And so 
Um, I would definitely be asking the question about how many products are you moving through here in a single day? How much capacity does a single line have? How many lines do you have? Those are the things that kind of give you a better idea. Um, and then the one other piece I would add to that was the specialized attention. And I will say that the ones that are typically a little bit more of a smaller board house um, may have a little bit more time if they're not running through. So some of your really big tier one contract manufacturers, those are going to be like, I'm running as many products through as possible. Um, some of the smaller houses that might have a little bit more engineering support or something like that, that are just kind of, hey, we're trying to get a few products through. They may be able to give you a little bit more specialized attention. But going back to the rule that we were talking about earlier, um, those boards, again, may look very similar. So ju just have the understanding that they will be able to talk to you a little bit about your product. But at the end of the day, your product may look very similar to another. What about if you are starting small, like maybe you just want a couple, uh, like a handful of products as like a prototype, but you're, you want to grow quickly and you want to eventually get to that 10,000 product point. Like, do you want at the beginning to find someone that can like specialize in just doing like a handful or do you want to immediately start with the guy that's gonna make 10,000? Like, is it easy to switch from CM to a different CM later? So I think there's multiple ways you can approach it, um, kind of how it works best for you. So there are CMs that do full run rate production that also have prototyping capabilities. And we'll do those prototyping, uh, we'll do that prototyping um, at a not crazy expensive rate if there is that promise of production later on. Um, and they, so that way you're staying within the same CM, you should be able to fluidly move from the, from the prototype phase to the production phase. But a lot of times, if you are just going to a large CM, they're not going to stop their line for a 20 piece order. Um, that's going to cost them a lot of money and they'll either they'll quote it, but it'll be outrageous or they just won't quote it at all. Um, so you can go with a smaller prototyping shop um, that specializes in that. Um, and then you can move to a CM. And I would just say if you are going to if you are going to do two separate CMs and you're going to someone that specializes in prototyping, they're going to understand that you're going to leave at some point. Right, they're going to understand that you're going to move over to production um, so you can get all the information you can from them as far as was there things in the process that could have gone smoother is there a way i can design this process better for production and a lot of times they're really willing to give you that feedback and let you know um, kind of what they saw from their experience um, and then you can get that sam involved maybe before you're ready for production while you're still doing that prototyping to make sure that you are designing it kind of like i mentioned earlier um, for their processes as well so you have CMs, but I wouldn't recommend once you're done prototyping, starting looking for a production CM, I would still definitely be looking for both around the same time. Um, and that way you can you can get into that CM early enough that once you're ready, you're ready to switch over pretty instantly. Yep. Yeah, and, and I would say too that uh, Taylor's comment, I think that's an important one, that there's that because of the ability for some companies to be able to do a certain amount of units, so based on the capacity they have, you may end up graduating from a CM where they're like, hey, I can't, you're gonna tie up all my lines for forever. I need other orders. I can't just, just run your product. So um, it, it isn't, it, it can be expected that you may eventually move out of a CM depending on their full capacity that they have. Awesome. All right, next question. What kinds of accreditations should we be looking for from CMs and why? Um, so I'll hit kind of the four I know, Keaton, and then if there's anything you want to add. Um, so for consumer, you should be looking for ISO 9000. Um, for aerospace, it should be AS91. Um, for medical, it should be that ISO 134858 we mentioned earlier. And for automotive, it should be TS6149. I'm not normally involved in the accreditation process um, or dealing with that with our CMs. So if, Keaton, if you have any other kind of points here. Um, I just kind of know the high level of what you should be looking for for your type of product. Yeah, I, I think the other thing that I would just look at is, so when you go to their website, they'll have listed what accreditations they have available for them. Um, and you kind of hit on some of the big ones that'll be standard. But as we kind of alluded to earlier, medical and DOD and stuff like that, if they have anything that's particular to them, they'll probably have it listed. Um, and, and some of it, again, just it varies based on the product that you're trying to build, right? Yeah. So if you have something that's going to be touching an end consumer, they may have a little bit of a different regulation than something that's just going to be working within an industrial-based facility. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, unfortunately, <laughs> we wouldn't be able to list the entirety of all certifications available. That is a very long article that I promise that we will write one day. Uh, but the whole point of it is that you will have you, you, that you would have different sort of certifications that are available for different kind of manufacturers associated with the product. So I would just kind of look associated with the area 
um, that you're focusing on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Beyond quality and price, what are the biggest red flags with a potential CM? Are there any red flags I should look out for when I call a CM on the phone for the first time? I think I was going to, to start on this one. So I'll talk about general red flags, at least for me, when, when I've worked with something in the past. Um, if you go into anybody and they're like really pushy to go and get your order and like they haven't asked for your design files and they're not asking for anything, that tends, tends to become very problematic very quickly. So uh, it, for me, I traditionally look at it as more of a um, think about like pushy sales tactics and things that seem like they would be a red flag. If something's too good to be true, it probably is. Don't go and, and like hand them your design. It probably is not coming back to you at that point. So I think when I'm thinking of red flags with the CM, I would just think around kind of general things that you would look for. Make sure they're asking for the appropriate documentation. Make sure you're handing the appropriate documentation in a way that seems secure. Make sure that you're just doing the due diligence that you would do. You're treating it essentially as you would any other sort of social security and anything like that. Just make sure that you're handling it in a way that would be um, transmitting and receiving in both a secure environment and with the right type of information that you should be looking for. Yeah, definitely. And I think something else to kind of to look for um, is, well, this it should be a partnership between you and the CM. So yeah. if it doesn't feel like that, I think that's also, you know, something kind of to, to Keen's point of that pushy sales tactic that they're just trying to sell you um, and they're not looking for how they can support you and your manufacturing and they're not asking any questions or following up on anything. I think that's a big red flag. Um, as well as if you're not really given a main point of contact or someone you can you can talk to a lot or directly, um, I would make sure that you're you know you're able to do that and maybe try to independently verify that you're you're working with someone um, that that does work for that that company. All right. If I find a CM that's cheap without accreditation, is it a guarantee that they'll be bad, or should I give them a shot? So while I can't speak to the quality of any you know, specific CM, accreditation is there for a reason. It's for your protection and the CMs as well. So personally, I highly suggest making sure you go with an accredited CM for you know, specifically consumer products. I mean, if you're going for medical or aerospace or anything, like we said before, it has to be accredited. There's no questions about that. Um, but yeah, I would, I would highly recommend staying with someone that's accredited. Um, that way you can get a look at that quality management system. You can see what they're what they're capable of from a quality standpoint, as well as you have that that third party that is going in there and making sure that they are they're doing what they say they're doing, right? So you have someone that's not connected to them that is verifying those claims so you know that you're in good hands. That makes sense. How much lead time should I give myself for selecting a CM? A month, six months, a year? Sure. I hope I'll I was say, Taylor, do you want to start off? Yeah. Um, I don't know if there's a specific lead time for this. Um, I think kind of like we've mentioned before that once you have a product and you're, you're, you have it and it's maybe 95% ready, maybe there's some small tweaks, um, but overall you have the design file that's ready to go. You have the bomb. Um, I would say you start looking for them right away. Um, I definitely wouldn't wait until, you know, you're ready for production. I would wait until you're maybe, maybe about six months, four months out, um, just kind of depending on the CM and if you potentially have to go visit and things like that, um, that all takes time, especially for going overseas. Um, but yeah, I definitely wouldn't wait until you're, okay, I'm ready to start production tomorrow. Um, it can happen, especially if you're looking for small runs in, in prototyping and you're looking in the area that you live in. Um, but it definitely, I'd say to go through, especially if this is your first time selecting a CM, I'd give yourself as much time um, and you can contact a CM and kind of get what they're about before you're maybe ready to get quoting and get costing, just so you know that once you're ready for that, you have um, you, you have that contact and you're ready to go get that costing um, right away. Um, but yeah, I would start getting if you if you know you're pretty close, I would start talking now um, and and getting close to to selecting your final CM that you're ready to use. Can yeah. you have anything else? Yeah, so um, just talking from kind of a personal experience example that we had. So we had a customer come through the Aero Certification Program, had all their files done, looked like everything was good to go. We go and we take it to a CM and, and we find out that, hey, one of these components is just gone. Like there's no stock of it anywhere. It's been bought out for like the Nintendo Switch or something like that. And so we had to do a complete respin at that point of their board to be able to say, hey, there's no way to, you're going to be able to get this Bluetooth chip and we're going to have to help you out. So in that circumstance, approaching the CM earlier on actually helped identify a stock shortage that they wouldn't have known about otherwise. 
um, and help them because they were going to they were going to miss their their deadlines otherwise. So I think starting that dialogue is good. Um, the other example that I'll bring up is we had a company that came in. Um, they were looking to go to production within about two months, and we found out that there was some problems with their files in terms of how the size of their traces. Um, and so in that circumstance, being able to engage with the CM, it looks at it a little bit more from a critical perspective of, is this ready to go to manufacturing? Not necessarily, is my design legitimate more? Can I build it? You know, Can I even actually go and get that done? So I would just say, start that conversation early, get a quote, take the files in, make sure it looks like it's going to go, make sure that they they can run it through kind of a machine to make sure everything's going to place appropriately, that it looks like it should. Um, and then at the end of the day, you know, you don't, you don't want to screw people around, but if you have a, a circumstance where you've gotten a quote from there and you say, this is not going to work, until you say you agree on a PO, you're not liable for anything from that end. So I, I just would recommend starting that discussion earlier when you feel like, hey, I got a, a first rev, I'm getting ready to put a few boards through um, so that you don't hit delays that you weren't expecting. Yeah, and, and to your point on that out of stock component, there also just might be might be components that have eight, 12 week lead time that you really yeah. didn't know about. So getting those potentially ordered earlier um, will save you a lot of time. When you're doing that first initial reach out, like how many do you recommend reaching out to and like getting quotes? Like CMs, they, they're used to this, right? They're used to getting quotes and then maybe not hearing back or is, do you have to, is there an opportunity to like negotiate or kind of hit them against each other ever? <laughs> Um, so I, I would recommend kind of if you find a few CMs that are in your in kind of what you're looking for and and ask you can always ask them questions and, and kind of get that information with no obligation of even potentially getting a quote. Um, so I would say getting all of that um, getting all of that information from as many CMs as you think fit what you're doing I think is is better than than getting too few. Um, so if if you're gonna do that and and you maybe get pricing from three or four CMs. Um, if, if three of those costs look the, pretty similar and one is vastly lower before I use that cost to try to go back to those other CMs, I would go back to that CM that gave you that lower cost and make sure that they quoted it properly. Make sure that they got all the components, make sure that it's completely understood of what's being quoted and make sure that you're comparing the right things because maybe they, maybe they assumed you were consigning all of the material or something that you didn't really realize that they had assumed. Um, so before you use that, make sure. And then, yeah, you can absolutely go either with target pricing on your initial quote, or you can go back with a renegotiation of, hey, we were actually, we we're hoping to hit this price and see if that CM can come down. Um, again, potentially that maybe they just bought new equipment. There's other things that might be driving those higher costs and they might be higher for a reason or the lower ones might be lower for a reason, right? So I would make sure that you're doing a good comparison of, you know, um, the the uh, quality and the turn times and everything like that versus what you're paying for. Because if you are paying significantly less, there might be a reason for it. Maybe it's just you found a great deal and that's awesome and let me know because I can always use that. But uh, um, sometimes it, it could be for a reason. So yeah, you can absolutely use that that pricing to go to other uh, CMs. I normally don't personally say, hey, I got this other quote from another CM. I normally say, hey, this is the target pricing we're looking to hit. Can you meet us there? And see, they might be able to get to get lower. And that's when you can see if they, you know, how bad they really want your business. And, you know, maybe it's someone that you had, you have great conversations with, you visited their site. It's great. You really connect with the per your contact there. And so maybe it's worth a couple extra bucks a board for that relationship as well. Yeah, I, I completely, to that last point, I, I really agree with that. Because in, in the circumstance where if you're successful, the CM is going to be successful as well. So we want to see it as a partnership. It's not just, hey, I'm going to make a few boards and we never speak again. If, if it works out and if your product's going great, then it's more business for them. You know the people there. They know the process. They maybe know how it's assembled, something like that. Those are things that are beneficial. So I think getting a few quotes is a really great idea. But then once you have someone, I'd really try to work to build a relationship. I think in the long term, it will help you over kind of building even more product than maybe just your initials. Yeah, absolutely. And when you're having those initial discussions, how important is it to do a site visit? Like how do you want to kind of narrow it down maybe between two or three and do you need to visit all of them or should you kind of pick your primary your first choice and visit that one and then sign off on it? Um, I would narrow it down um, to, to, a, to a handful. Um, I think it really depends too. If they're all in the general same area, if you're going to be traveling, 
um, I would I would try to visit as many as you can. Just even if you have a great first experience of the first one you go to, that's your top choice. Make sure that you have something to compare it to, right? Because maybe it looks great, but then maybe you go to another facility. And you're like, oh well, this they have this other software that could really help me, or this other technology or equipment that could really help me in this. Um, so I definitely make sure you you visit a few if if possible. Um, especially if um, they're all in the same area and you're making the trip, I would definitely utilize that to make sure that you look at all of them. Cause maybe you go with the CM for a while and like Keaton had mentioned earlier, maybe you outgrow them, right? And maybe you need to go to another CM. And so then you already have kind of that contact and relationships and you have a general idea cause you've gone and visited to those other CMs that you can, you can spark up that conversation again with them. Awesome. So I know we talked about how some CMs can do kind of a small sample run for you. How small can you go? Like, can you literally ask them to create one prototype? It truly depends on the, on the CM. So I do work with, with CMs that are strictly prototyping kind of houses that will do one. A lot of them prefer maybe at least five just to make sure if there is fallout that they, they can go through that, that whole process. If there's one you run a risk of, if you get a bad part, you get a bad board, anything like that, and you have to order and wait and do that lead time all over again. Um, so I recommend trying to do at least five personally. Um, but yeah, there are CMs that will do that. Um, it really depends on the CM. And again, if you're going to a production CM that is 10,000 units at a time for per order, um, they're not going to want to stop their line and do five. So potentially maybe they have a prototyping line they can throw you on, um, or you would need to go to a strictly prototyping house. Um, but yeah, I would recommend doing at least five for that. Yep, and I, I would echo that sentiment. You know, typically when we're looking at an engineering project and we're saying how many boards should we start for an initial run, it's somewhere in the five to ten range. Um, and then now you're looking to see, do I have any fallout on, on and failures on the boards? Because when you're at that level of boards, say five to ten, if you have one failure, I mean that's twenty percent or you know ten percent if you're doing ten boards, something like that, which is rather significant. You know, and, and so you just you kind of need to be able to keep that in mind when you're looking at it. So. I think that's a good number to make sure that you didn't just get one bad board. Um, but I also think it's not going to necessarily put you way over the top. You'll get kind of a few that you can run tests on and make sure you're actually getting quality back. Yeah, absolutely. We've had a couple of questions on like general kind of standard CM agreements. Uh, so how do how is the agreement usually set up? Is it per unit? Is there a flat fee? Like how do they how do they normally charge you in terms of like payment and stuff? So I'll speak to my experience first, Keaton, and then if, if you've had other experiences. But so normally we see it at a per unit basis. However, with the caveat of attached to a certain order size. So your size for 100 units or your sorry, your per unit cost for 100 units is going to be very different than your per unit cost for 10,000 units. So normally that's how you see it. You see it as a per unit and then a total cost for that order. Um, and then there will be, you know, potentially any um, non-recurring fees for like setup fees. Um, that would be flat fees normally across all of the the units. Um, so if you don't make any changes and you order a thousand, you should you should only have to pay those once. Um, but if you do make any small changes, you could have to pay those again, and those can be like stencil charges, um, you know, any any in house fees that they have to do in order to make sure that your product is is ready for production. Yep. Yeah, and, and I'd say the only other circumstance that I've seen is, is still a per unit basis. But if you have a CM who's also associated with a design services firm. Um, they may be able to take some of what you would pay in NRE, the, the non-refundable engineering cost that's going to be associated with the one time for getting your design done, and roll that into your price per unit. So you'll have a blanket service agreement that says, from here on out, when I buy a board from this company, I'm going to be paying this much for the board. And that helps if you are in a circumstance where like, hey, I don't have $100,000 to go and get design work done. I kind of just need my units. But you're going to end up eating it a little bit on the back end when your boards are a little bit higher cost than you would normally expect. So um, it is just it's an alternative pricing model. I've seen a couple of times where people will do it, that they really want to try to help you get your design in. And then they'll end up manufacturing for you and do sort of a longer agreement. Um, but in that circumstance, again, it is a cost per unit. Yeah, and that's how, honestly, I traditionally do our costing when I get um, costing from our CM. Unless the customer specifically needs that NRE ruled out, I normally um, amortize it across whatever unit size they're looking at. So if you're doing, again, if you're doing 100 units, it'll be more per unit um, than if you're doing 1,000. But that's how I look at it, but we can also break it out. Yep. 
So I, how does it work exactly if you need the CM to make a change, maybe like you're, you're partially through the process and then all of a sudden you're like, oh wait, no, I need to fix this, I need to change this. Like, does that cost more? Like, what are the repercussions? How, how do they handle that? So it, it really depends on how far along in, in what process. Um, if you've already placed an order and parts are on order and um, the, the design services or the NREs have already been done, um, then that can be a very costly change that you have to make. Um, so if you're switching out one component, for example, well, if they've already ordered that other component, um, you now have to pay for both. Um, those are both going to be there. Your assembly shouldn't change too much, much um, on, on a per unit basis, but if they've already done all of their NRE stuff, um, they might have to do new stencil charges, um, stuff like that, that could add up as well. Um, and if you're, but if you're switching on a component and it's before they've done any of that, um, you should really only have to pay whatever that delta is in that component. And if it's before your order's placed, right? So, or if it's in between orders, um, but if it's in between orders, they've already built it and they've done those stencils and things like that, you might have to, you might have to pay additional fees, um, but it's really going to depend on the situation. And I, I don't know if you have anything else for that. Yeah, so just, just kind of a real life example that we had. So we had a board go through and we were trying to kind of move pretty quickly on it. They built the printed circuit board, so the, the green kind of bare board layer of it. Um, and we found out that, hey, the capacitors they spec were way too big. They were not gonna be able to fit. Um, thankfully, we were able to cross it to a little bit of a smaller size and be able to find those and still be able to push the board through. And, and the only change at that point was just the cost in sourcing the components, which we had to pay just to get them expedited over. Um, but outside of that, we were still able to move forward in production. So it can be from a very little of, hey, I have you know 10 capacitors that are a couple cents and I just need to get them expedited overnight, which is not cheap. Um, or it could be very expensive, which is this is not going to work at all from board's perspective and we're going to have to respin entirely. So um, again, as, as kind of we alluded to earlier, really make sure your design files are as best as they can be and that you went vetted through them multiple times before you send them over. Yeah, and you just reminded me of something I've, I've kind of been dealing with uh, the past couple couple months. I've been uh, kind of project managing one of our one of our products that came through your team um, that's in production that we just shipped uh, units last night for. Um, but so we got the first articles done back. We got 20 units from the from the, the CM and the design engineer on the uh, customer side was testing it and realized that one of the, I'm not very technical, so apologize, I apologize in advance, um, but something was flipped 180 that shouldn't been, and that's how, and the, but it was built to design files. And this was on the board itself. So we had to go and expedite and get a thousand more boards spun, get them expedited, um, five day turn, and get them overnighted or expedite shipping from, from China um, in order to get them in-house, so that way we could sell these units before Christmas. Um, so yeah, definitely make sure your design files are good. And if you need, make sure you test them out, do small runs, make sure everything looks good before you you place all of your money into a PO that you're not, you know, if you're not sure of those design files, it can really come back. And whose fault is that in that case? Like, is there some sort of warranty or something? Or if it comes back and it's poor quality, like, will they redo it? Like, how does that work? So in this case, it was the design. Um, so the, the CM and the, uh, the board house built it to the design files. So on that case, this case, it was the customer's fault, um, for lack of a better word. And they ended up having to pay for the extra thousand boards and the expediting and all of that. Um, so for that case, it was the customer, but if there is a lot of the CMs, at least I work with, we have, they have, you know, one year warranties, again, getting whatever that warranty is in writing and, and asking them about what their standard is. Um, but yeah, if, if, the boards would have been, if that was not a design fail and it was a production fail, um, yeah, it definitely would have been not on our customer to have to go in and, and fix it. All right. And then how does it work if you need to stop working with a CM? Like if, if something like that happens and you're really unhappy with the quality or something like that, like what are the like typical penalties or like can you just kind of walk away at the end of the day or how does that work? So it depends if you've you've entered into a, any agreement that you're going to give them X amount of units over a time period. Um, so it really depends on kind of what you what you enter in to begin with. But if there's no agreement and you're kind of just you're placing orders and you're going through that, um, there's no necessarily penalty for walking away and, and just, you know, making that clear that, hey, this is why we're leaving. Um, you know, 
these we're not up to our standards and we're going with someone else that can meet those needs. And I mean, at the end of the day, it is business. It's not personal, right? So if your product is not being made to your standard, um, there's no, nothing wrong with going and try to find someone else to do it, but just make sure that you're not breaking any contract um, or non-compete or anything else that you may have signed. So make sure you're really, really looking over all of that and make sure you can leave um, if necessary. Yep, and, and I think kind of as we talked about earlier, so owning the design files gives you some of the key to be able to say, hey, if I'm if I'm unhappy, I want to be able to move and I can go and take my design somewhere else with whatever changes have been made. Um, kind of like a cell phone in that regard, you walk away with your phone number and you can go to another carrier kind of idea. But um, it is important to make sure you have access to those design files. Otherwise, you're kind of stuck. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, and we talked a little bit about like accreditations and how important those are, but is there any sort of like ranking or rating system? Is there like a Yelp for CMs? Like how, is there like some sort of like universal system that people can kind of like compare apples to apples or anything like that out there? Keaton, do you know of anything? Because I don't. <laughs> Yeah, so what, I'll, what I would say is the, the biggest thing you can be able to tell is um, there's different tiers associated with contract manufacturers based on the amount of units that they produce. Um, so in that circumstance, you'll have uh, tier one partners, which can do a, a really big, and those are some of the big name ones, um, tier two, tier three, tier four, so on. Um, and so when you're looking at a tier ranking, that is one way to be able to at least tell how much production they'll be able to do. You can kind of tell how many units and what classification they're put in. Um, you know, outside of that, I think from my experience, what I've tried to do is if I'm going to be moving with a, a new CM, I'm going to build a few boards to try to test the quality of myself. I will say this. I've worked with plenty of people who they swear by one contract manufacturer and another person completely has sworn off that contract manufacturer. The same is true with suppliers and components and whatnot. Um, I know it's the same idea with like TVs. I know people who they will never touch Samsung or something like that. Um, so, you know, the whole point of it being is test it for yourself. Um, and I would highly recommend, again, we talked about a few boards. I, I had a, a, a group of mine that we were working with. They ran 40 boards, 10 through four different um, contract manufacturers just to see what the failure rate was that came back on them and then kind of what the relationship was like from there. Um, and they, they kind of found from there who they liked working with. Um, even if it was maybe differences on costs. So I, I definitely think that um, unfortunately there's no like, hey, Google, what is the, the best contract manufacturer? Um, but I think working with someone yourself will probably give you the best personal experience um, as compared to what any other rankings they can give. And for somebody that maybe is like brand new to this, maybe they don't have an engineering background, they're not super technical, but they have an idea they're really passionate about. Is there like a kind of CM for beginner or some sort of um, like CM that can really help them through the process? So I'll talk from my experience and then I'll, I'll let you talk to some Taylor. So my, my thoughts around this is I've worked a couple with um, some companies that are EMS, so online based companies that'll do it. Um, and I've had some decent experience in terms of if it's a new design, being able to take it and just kind of run it in. The nice thing about those is many of those have tools that are built in on the website that will do automatic design rule checks that says, does this pass the criterion that you're expecting to? Um, and so for me, when I was doing this, it didn't make me look like a dummy because I could say, hey, uh, that doesn't work. And so I can go back and try to make some corrections before I started talking with anybody as a person. So my recommendation is there are some tools, um, companies like Macrofast, Circuit Hub, those kind of things that have the availability where you can go in and say, hey, I'm just going to plug this in, see how it kind of comes out and go from there. Um, so if, if it was me, that would be the route I would test is run my design files through, kind of do a quick sanity check and, and work from there. Um, and they may be able to help you a little bit more. Taylor, do you have anything else? Yeah, and kind of maybe before that, um, if you're at a point where you don't even have design files, then you're truly just working on a, on a napkin concept. Um, I would find a partner or find a design firm that that's all they do is do that design work and they can really help you make sure that that's all designed properly. Um, and then you have someone else in it too that you can you know run, run through things with um, and things like that. Um, but yeah, I would highly recommend if you don't have any any experience and you, but you have this great idea, I'd find someone that can help you make it a reality. Um, and then you can go once it's, once it's a little more complete, go kind of what through Keen just mentioned. Yeah. And I think to Taylor's point, one thing that you can look at is many boards will have reference designs associated to the board, which says, if you build it to this exact specification, you'll produce this board, which they'll also sell as a development kit or something like that. So a good way to potentially go about it would be take reference design files that should be verified that they'll come out 
as they're expecting and just run with those. If you don't have your design kind of done and you want to, you're working with an Arduino or Raspberry Pi or something like that, um, see if you can find a reference design associated with one of those designs and start there and run a few things. And then maybe you can graduate and say, hey, all right, I'm ready to try it a little bit more. Yeah, absolutely. All right, we are approaching the end of the time. So I'll do one last question for you guys. So if somebody is interested in joining the Aero certification program, what type of resources can you guys offer in terms of like helping to find a CM, design, like all that kind of stuff? Sure, all right, so I'll talk to the engineering side and I'll let Taylor talk to Aero from a, a manufacturing side. Yeah. Uh, from an engineering side, what the Aero certification program is intended to do is to kind of be your partner in terms of moving your design along. So um, I've talked about this before, but you know, Aero's whole goal is we want to make sure that you have a smooth design because if you essentially are able to get your boards built and you have components, then we want to be your partner in terms of sourcing those. Um, so when you sign up for the program, you're going to be able to get in touch with an engineer on my team. We'll take a look at a high level at your design, be able to ask any sort of high level design questions you might have and just try to steer you in the right direction. Um, and, and we're kind of doing that just to make sure that we want to be your partner as you grow. We want to grow with you. Um, so, you know, definitely apply for the program from an engineering side. We are really excited to get to see all the really cool projects we've seen some of the most unique and fun things, really innovative stuff that are coming through. So um, from my end, if that's that's the route that I would go. Taylor, what do you got? Yeah, so after you kind of go through what, what Keith mentioned, um, I, I get involved. Um, so that's where, you know, specifically I, I work with the prototyping and the low volume. So if this truly is, you know, a brand new design that you're going through those iterations, definitely be working with me and we would find a CM um, that we have, a, we have a whole, you know, kind of, slew of CMs that we can use either here or overseas. Um, we typically do all of our prototyping um, here in the States just because that's where it's uh, easier um, and we, we have more control over here. Um, but we have some CMs that are super cost effective that can also do your production as well, depending on what kind of volume you're looking for. Um, and if you know those requirements are to be built in the US, we can we definitely have that as well. So I would work with you on um, getting all those design files sent over and I would send them over to the CM myself um, and maybe multiple CMs, right? Depending on where I think that it fits best in, in their niche. Um, and I would get that costing back. I would go back and try to negotiate a little bit depending on what we get back. Then I would supply that quote to you. Um, and if you're ready to go, to move forward with that, basically um, we would place a PO, we'd get your credit set up. We'd kind of go through all of that. And we would, I would be the one in contact with the CM getting status updates. Um, things like that. So it's not something you have to deal with. Um, and, and then we would be, uh, they'd build your product, ship it if they want direct to direct to customer, to you, um, anything like that, we can do that. And then once your prototyping is done, you're ready for production. I can handle that low rate production depending on what that means for, because that means different things for different people, right? If you're selling like crazy, you might need to go straight into uh, to that full run rate production. Um, but if not, you know, I can handle that kind of thousand, 2000, 3000 kind of really depends on the product and the situation. Um, and then I can handle that all the way through until you're ready to graduate from me. Um, and then we have a whole dedicated team, our advanced manufacturing team that can completely handle your production um, as well. And they'll be involved, you know, pretty early on in that process to make sure that we can get some, some quotes for those, those higher run rates as well. Um, so that's kind of where I would take over that manufacturing side and really make sure that you're taken care of. So a lot of those kind of issues that we've talked about with IP and visiting CMs and things like that is something that you don't have to worry about and you can worry on, worry about your design, your marketing, selling your product, things like that can, you know, you can focus on completely and we can take over that production side for you. Awesome, thank you guys so much. If anyone has more questions, just click on that green button, sign up for the program, it's totally free, and the engineers at Arrow can help you take a look at your projects. We also have educational resources and other webinar recordings. Just go to indiegogo.com and check out our education center. Uh, and then also keep an eye out for our upcoming AMAs and webinars with Arrow and AT&T Business. So Keaton and Taylor, thank you so much for your time today. It was super, super helpful. And thank you to everyone for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Thanks, everyone. Awesome. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye.